Happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to the Sabbath School, lesson number 10, Doing the Unthinkable. I want to thank uh, Brother Mark Passion and Sister Cindy de la Peña for helping us teach the lesson review. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we ask that you forgive us from our sins. Be merciful to us, Lord. Give us wisdom and understanding as we study your word. Bless those who are watching and listening, Lord. Bless also us as we discuss your word to your children. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So just a quick overview. Our lesson is very nice, right, Mark? Yes. And uh, Sister Cindy, it's very nice. It's about Jesus. It's like the whole Bible. So the days uh, uh, we are going to look in, it's about Isaiah. Actually, we are studying Isaiah chapter 50, 52, 53. And these are very nice prophecies about Jesus Christ. Isaiah's testing truth on Sunday, the suffering servant, poems about Jesus, deep, deep prophecies about Jesus. And then uh, in Isaiah 52, who has believed in Tuesday, all about things in the mission of Jesus and the unreachable us. Jesus' object of uh, rescue is us and our attitude, what's happening to us, what we are supposed to do and uh, the sacrificial or the offerings, how when we, when because of Jesus' offering of his life, we also do that and it transforms us. And actually it's very nice. So uh, our, we are trying to read uh, all the texts as, as much as possible that will fit in the time because uh, the texts are more important than our comments. Uh, but uh, it's very, very powerful and very, very nice uh, text. So our memory text, Sister Cindy, can you read our memory text? Our memory text is found in Isaiah 53 verse 5. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Wow. Ah, this verse is very loaded, Brother Mark. Yeah, I want to, you know, I want to really stop in this verse. Wounded for our transgressions. If you want to talk, you just uh, tell me because I really like to uh, to ponder on this because I have many transgressions. Bruised for our iniquities. Ah, and the chast chastisement for our peace was upon him. You know, uh, when we sin, we have no peace, but because of Jesus Christ, peace comes to us. And this is one of the, you are a nursing graduate. By his stripes, we are healed. Sometimes we wonder, how come my wound gets healed? How come when we get sick, we get healed? I think this is one of the explanations. Because Jesus Christ was beaten. That's why we are healed. What can you say, Brother Mark? You know, it's, it's pretty interesting how uh, it says here that he was wounded for transgression. If you look at the language portrayed in this verse specifically, it says, I mean, I mean, keep in mind these words, wounded, bruised, and then healed. There is this idea that suffering equates to healing. And it's only through Christ, through his suffering, can we experience true healing healing from sin, healing from bad relationships, healing from, I mean, you name it, all the sin that you could think about. There's this idea that because of his suffering, we can receive healing in our own lives. Wow, that's so profound. In Philippians 2, 7, it further says, but made himself of no reputation. You know, sometimes we get demoted or but Jesus Christ, he was, if you're up here, it's like very hard to go down, right? Yeah, humanly speaking. But Jesus Christ, he was God and he made himself of no reputation, you know? Sometimes I wonder, where am I going to sleep? But I remember, I, at least it's better than a manger. <laughs> Taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. Sometimes, uh, you know, when, when I read this one, I want to be a servant also. I want to be like Jesus, you know? It's like, it doesn't matter who you are. If there's something lowly that needs to be done, ah, Jesus is the best example. Now let's look at Sunday. Isaiah's testing truth. Wow. 
Isaiah 54 to 10. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned. Um, this is, is this correct, Mark? This me is uh, Jesus Christ. Yes. Okay. That I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. So this is Isaiah's prophecy given to him by the Holy Spirit about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we will see later, if we have time, the fulfillments of these prophecies. Wow. He, he awakens me morning by morning. Well, if you want to be like Jesus, you know, you can pray that the Holy Spirit will wake you up morning by morning to meditate on his word. To awaken, he awakens my ear to hear us the learned. Okay, wow. Uh, you know, Jesus likes to listen to his teachers. Jesus likes to listen to God's word. The Lord has opened my ear. I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those. Wow, how come uh, Jesus was not a boxer? Because uh, he submits, you know, he said, if you are uh, hit in one cheek, you give the other cheek. So I think there is no uh, <laughs> a place for a pugilistic uh, sports in Jesus' uh, ministry. And my cheek to those who plucked out the bird. He's not uh, retaliatory, yeah? I did not hide my face from shame and spit. Okay, in, now your turn. You enjoy it. <laughs> you know, there's this idea here in this, in this text of the humility of Jesus. This self-sacrificing love mixed with hum, humi uh, humility. And it's just interesting how Jesus didn't fight back. Jesus didn't puff himself up into notice. Jesus didn't seek for attention you know he came just as he was and you know it's interesting when you study the background of israel they were expecting as ellen white mentions a conquering king because of the roman oppression over the jews over israel they were looking for a king who would dominate the romans the roman government in particular and because they did not see this in jesus they were shocked and they were wondering, where is our Messiah? Where is our conquering king? Where is the person that would, you know, annihilate the Roman government? Where is our freedom? And when they saw Jesus coming in all humility and humbleness, they were just shocked. You know, many times we are shocked. You know, sometimes we expect God, you know, to be, a, to be like this all amazing God, but sometimes... Uh, sometimes he doesn't answer our prayers. Isn't that interesting? I'm sure Cindy can attest to that. Um, I agree with that. But uh, one thing that I also saw here is um, we see his humility, but even in spite of, so we see from verses 5 down to 10, how the people were like um, mocking Jesus, spitting on him, um, you know, just mocking him face, the face to face. And in ver verse 4, it says that he, that he should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. So imagine like you are suffering yourself. Like people don't really like you. People are, are mocking you, are persecuting you. But your desire is still to, to those who are weary, to lift up those who are on the ground. So it's like he went so low, but he longed to lift up those who are there at the bottom. So that stood out to me as like, so amazing how his humility um, did not just you know it was not all low low lang it was to lift people up to encourage those who are weary and those who are discouraged amen yeah furthermore it says here i did not hide my face from shame and spitting this happened right yes you know people spit in jesus face and they tried to uh, put him to shame for the lord god will help me Therefore, I will not be disgraced. It's amazing how Jesus himself was God, but he depended on his Father in heaven like us we should be, we should also do. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. You see, I think a flint is something uh, small, yeah? You know, but uh, Jesus Christ was so confident from God his Father that you know, his mission, even if everybody else is persecuting him, you know, the truth is stable. He is near who justifies me, who will contend, who will contend with me. 
Wow! If God is on our side, the Bible says, who can be against us, right? The whole world, no problem. He is near. Who, okay. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. Surely the Lord God will help me. Who is he who will condemn me? Indeed, they will all grow like old like a garment. It's true. If people are persecuting us, they, they're going to grow old and die. But if they repent, then we will all be saved. Yeah? The moth will eat them up. Who <laughs> is very funny. Moth are small things. And imagine your enemies will be eaten by a moth. By a moth. Who among you fears the Lord? Who obeys the voice of his servant? Who walks? Uh, my friends uh, watching, you look, if you see the text, there are capital H. That, that's talking about Jesus Christ, servant, who walks in darkness and has no light. Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. Wow. So if you are in the darkness of your life, trust in the Lord. You have something? Yes, it's, it's, it's interesting that we see that God was, Jesus was a servant of all servants. There is this idea uh, that is made very plain or very clear in scripture and also in spirit of prophecy. It's the idea of the contrast between humility and when someone is self-exultant. If you take it, if you look at it this way, Satan wanted to be the very top. And he sought to be like the Most High, as says in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. And Satan wanted to be above God. He wanted the worship that he received from the angels and all the beings that he created. So Satan strided to hit the top. But Jesus, on the other hand, he was at the top. But he descended lower and lower to be at our own level, as, as it mentions in Philippians 2. Let this mind be in Christ, which was also in Christ Jesus, who took on the form of a bond servant and suffered the shame even to the death of the cross. And so we see this idea that Satan strided to go upward, but Jesus strided, uh, st sorry, strove to go downwards. And the result of that was that in the end, Satan, even though he went for the top, in the end we know he will be... As Revelation 20, he will be cast into the lake of fire. But Jesus, even though he suffered the second death, he was resurrected from the from the grave, and now he is in heaven. It's, it's so interesting. There's this contrast between humility and self-exaltation or pride. Yeah, I think I also read that while studying the lesson. It They called it, they referred it as the valley. The valley, some, the valley, the valley in Philippians 2. So it's like, you know how a valley is so it's like low from the top and then it goes low and then it goes up again so it's like the whole experience of jesus so from the very highest position and then he went down for us and then only to lift us up again so it's very interesting that you mentioned that as well okay let's continue isaiah 49 7 thus says the lord the redeemer of israel you know i when when i hear this redeemer i'm so happy because redeemed, redeemed, uh, 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 you know, it benefits us all. Redeemed, uh, the, their Holy One, to Him whom man despises, to Him whom the nations abhor. You know, sometimes, do you ever feel that the people don't like you? Don't like you, you know, for some reason, for whatever. We can, God, Jesus Christ can relate with us. He is, he, to Him whom man despises, to Him whom the nations abhor. Do you ever, the people hate you because of righteousness sake, because of truth? Jesus also, that happened to Jesus. So we are in the same place of Jesus if that happens to you. Kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel. And he has chosen you. Wow. Jesus Christ is the center of all this very nice prophecies i wonder i uh, wish this the israelites read this took it seriously so they did not have uh, they would not have missed jesus christ yeah maybe they were only reading the cloud nine part of the prophecies not the humble part of the prophecies and i think it's also applicable that now we we should lo look at all the prophecies so we will not have a mistake in the future
You know, it's it's interesting. Uh, it reminds me of a verse in, I believe it's John chapter 1. And it says that Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. So in, in other words, when Jesus came to his people, the Israelite people, the Jewish nation, they missed the boat. They knew the prophecies. They studied scripture. They, they memorized Torah. You know, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But at the same time, when Jesus came to the scene, they, they didn't recognize their Redeemer. They did not recognize their Messiah. And as a result, they, they missed the boat, so to speak. And it's, I believe it's an object lesson for us living in, in the last days that we may know Scripture, we may know Spirit of Prophecy, but if we don't know Jesus we could potentially miss the second coming uh, of, of Jesus, like how the Jews missed the first coming of Jesus. You want it? Yeah, it's interesting as well because I, I read that there are two representations of Jesus coming. One is as a lamb and the other is as a lion. And I think it had something do, to do with the expectations of the, of the Israelites, of the people of God. They were looking for 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 Jesus to appear in the form of a lion but they had it the other way around you know Jesus first has to come as a lamb and then the second time that he will come second coming um he will come as a lion a conquering king so i think they they expected first a, li a lion like a mighty king who will like what you mentioned earlier who will save them from oppression of the romans okay in continuation to what brother mark said uh we have to know Jesus. And I was, you know, I was praying how for many uh, weeks because people were talking about Jesus and I was praying, how do we, how can, well, how will I know if I know Jesus? Because I know the Holy Spirit, but Jesus, I, he went away already a long time ago. So I was praying to God, where in the Bible can we measure if we know Jesus? And then uh, I, the Holy Spirit uh, gave us this verse in 1 John 2, 3. The objective rubric, if we know to measure how we know Jesus. Let me read it. Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. Wow. Man, when I read this, I was so happy. Because we have the measurement, a rubric measurable, you know, in nursing, measurable. In the academics, it's a rubric of how we know Jesus if we keep. So you just list all the commandments and then check, check, check. And that's how you know Jesus. And then I, th that is what I understand from this uh, verse. So if we also see in Second Samuel 10 verse 1 to 12, to summarize it, King David attacked and conquered the country of Ammon because the king of Ammon seized David's envoys, shaved off half of the beard of each, cut off their garments in the middle of their hips and sent them away. So it's like experiencing the same humiliation and mocking that Jesus experienced. And what was the King David's response? He attacked and conquered the country of Ammon because he, he was king. He had the power to do so. But imagine Jesus, like all of heaven was at his command. And all these people was, was attacked. All the people were attacking him, were, were spitting on him, mocking him. But he did not retaliate. And even the people even challenged him. If you remember, um, the people told him, if you really are the Messiah, save yourself. How can you even save us? You can't even save yourself. So it, and they even told him, just if, if you will come down from the cross, if you will come down from the cross, then we would believe. And Jesus could have easily, you know, freed himself from the cross. Yeah, that's, so, that right? that's so interesting. You know, Jesus was actually in desire of ages. He was tempted to come down the, from the cross mm. and you know he yeah. could have he, he could have yeah, he from had the, the power to do so he had the power he yeah. had all of angels. angels yeah they were waiting for him to like okay we you know just you know say the word say the and word, we, yeah. we got your back you know we can just annihilate <laughs> <laughs> everything if you just say the word um but jesus did not exercise that 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 choice that power to just stop what he was doing at the cross he could have come down he could have he could have saved himself he could have he could have saved he could have made people believe at in, that time at that time that he was the true messiah but if he did that 
they would have believed, but what about us living after that time? And what about Adam and Eve? They were longing for that Messiah to come, as, as mentioned in Genesis 3.15, the seed, right? They were longing for that Savior, Jesus, to come on the scene to defeat the serpent. If Jesus was to come down from the cross, if Jesus was to fight back with all of his forces, then Satan would have won. Satan would have been like, I got Jesus now. I told you so. No one I can. I told you so. Yeah. <laughs> Look, he didn't die for you. Mm. He didn't meet the demands of sin. No yes. one can. And so it, it would prove his claims in heaven that, you know, it's true that God is really exacting and his, his law is unreasonable. But, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thought for me to think that Jesus stayed on the cross for us. Mm. For, for us, the living in this time. That's so beautiful. Yeah, thank you so much. You know, in the, in the, in the last uh, verse of that uh, battle, there is, a, this, there is a very nice uh, text. Be of good courage. Let us be strong for our people and for the cities of our God. Wow. You know, when you are in God's side fighting for God, I mean, God is so big, but he gives you the opportunity to, uh, with your small capability to work for him. It's so amazing. And may the Lord do what is right, good in his sight. Well, so, uh, really, God can do everything, but he gives us opportunity also to help us in doing the mission. Now, we, there's another verse here about Jesus Christ. Isaiah 6, uh, 9, 6, and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Wow. Okay. There, uh, in uh, Isaiah 11, 1 to 16, this is the reign of Jesse's offspring. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Wow. That is the best thing that can happen when the spirit of the Lord rests on Jesus Christ. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. That's why the Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom and understanding, right? The spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. I still remember uh, Ron Closet's book, Adventism's Greatest Need, The Outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Wow. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. Not like us humans, we look and we hear and then we judge according to our senses, but Jesus Christ reads the heart. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor. Wow, many of us are poor. Sometimes we think it's not fair, but Jesus Christ comes to our rescue and decide with equity. Nadaya, have you been cheated? Jesus Christ comes with equity for the meek of the earth. Are we too meek? Are you too meek to complain, to fight for your rights? Jesus Christ is behind you. He, he takes note of everything and he will refund you of all your sufferings when you work for him. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. He shall slay the wicked. This is going to happen in the last days, right? This is a prophecy that uh, when Jesus comes, Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. I think this is now in heaven. Yeah, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion, and the fatling together. And you know, when this uh, I watch the National Geographic, oh, the TV where the lions attack the other animals, I am very sad because all of these things happen because of our sins and our domain suffers also. But in heaven, they will be uh, nice to each other. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie together, the lion shall eat straw like... Oh, even the lion Mark is vegetarian. <laughs> huh? Interesting. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole and the wind child shall put his hand in the viper's den. Ah, very scary now, but in heaven, 
you can do it they shall not do you want to go to heaven my friend Re read this one they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy nations no more wild animals all the animals in heaven are kind for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the lord when everybody has knowledge of god nobody attacks each other right even the animals they are kind and in that day there shall be the root of jesse i think this is just christ because it's capital who shall stand as the banner a banner to the people for the gentiles when i read gentiles i always know that we are not jews right it's the jews and the jews everybody who is not jew is gentile and all filipinos are gentiles <laughs> but we have become jews uh, through the grafting for the gentiles shall seek him and his resting place shall be glorious that's why if you want to be saved jesus christ is our solution only it shall come to pass in that day that the lord shall set his son hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people usually the remnant when everybody else is doing evil those who are faithful they are the remnant and god will retrieve and recover who are left from syria and egypt and patos patros and kosh and elam and china and all the islands of the sea so from different wow this is very nice because all the god's children are going to uh, go to heaven he will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts casts of israel do you feel like an outcast sometimes yeah jesus will assemble the outcasts of israel and gather together the dispersed of judah from the four corners of the earth also have you been persecuted and run away from your home israel jesus christ will unite us again and the adversaries of judah shall be cut off ephraim shall not envy judah huh? do we envy each other in ministry huh? we have so many views and some people have no views but in heaven we will not envy each other because we will be united but they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the philistines they used to be enemies but now they, uh, they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the philippines uh, for not Philist philippines philistines together they shall plunder the people of the east you know what plunder means that means uh later or uh, the meek shall inherit the earth yeah that's uh, another meaning they shall lay their hand on edom and moab and the people of ammon these are these used to be enemies of the israelites shall obey them the lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of egypt they used to be uh slaves here in egypt but now the, the lord will destroy the tongue of the sea of egypt and his with his mighty wind the wind remember the the wind in egypt he will shake his fist over the river and strike it in the seven streams and make men cross over dry shed oh it's like a reminder of what happened when they exited egypt there will be a highway of the remnant of his people who will be left from assyria it's like from slavery there is a highway from this world from assyria from the enemies there's a highway going to heaven as for it was for israel in the day that it came up or as it was for israel that means it will be like that yeah and everybody will go to heaven it's a very nice prophecy it's like the whole great controversy is uh, written there in isaiah amazing okay so i think thank you for reading like the whole passage passage sir i think the the point here is that people think when we're studying isaiah 53 it's like the later part of isaiah right on um, and they think that isaiah 53 down is like the bulk of isaiah and it's like that that's the most important prophecy but when we look at the verses that sir win just read from isaiah 7 9 11 42 we can see how jesus life on earth um played out it's like from his from his identity as a divine king from the, uh, to the restoration of israel and the quiet ministry of liberation from injustice and suffering so it's like isaiah was painting a picture but he was doing it in in steps like starting from the very beginning the prophecy of his birth and what his mission is it's like going from that building upon that until he reaches the climax or like the the dramatic part of the the movie or like the story so the the suffering of jesus which is in isaiah 53. yeah that's very interesting like it he kind of outlines the whole life of jesus like from his birth to his life to the conflicts that he had with people all around him to how he dealt with people and uh so jesus 
was big, uh, Isaiah outlines the whole life of Jesus, and then it climaxes at the cross in Isaiah 53, which talks about his sufferings and the blood that he shed and people spitting in his face and, you know, just the suffering and agony that he goes through. And then now here we see that in heaven, when you fast forward to the end of the Bible in Revelation chapter 21, 22, you see that there is this, uh, this gathering together of all of God's remnant people, God's saints, all to be with him in heaven. And now they are... Uh, mingling with with one another like as it was mentioning like even the enemies like the philistines they are now our brothers and sisters so could you imagine like isaiah is like he's he's kind of like displaying this whole great controversy theme even to the end when sin has been demolished sin has been no more and now we see that we can enjoy heaven without any sin without any satan without any death without any suffering but there is one thing that Jesus will still have on him that 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 he he'll never like he can never change it. Did you guys did you guys know that when Jesus when he was uh, when he came to this earth, he not only uh, stripped himself from glory, from the riches, from the throne, from his power, but he also promised or but he sorry but he also uh, made a, a an agreement to be human, to have this humanity on him that Ellen White actually says Jesus took upon humanity that can never be, that he, he can't, like he'll always have it with him. And we see that so clearly, even Isaiah later on in the chapter, it talks about the nail prints in his hands. And, and the little child is asking, what is these little prints in these hands? And then Jesus replies, it's from my friends who had pierced me. So Jesus takes this humanity upon himself. And he now he understands what, what it's like for us when we sin, when we suffer. Jesus gets to, to experience that. Yeah, there's a very nice uh, passage here in Isaiah 52, 13. Behold, my servant, you know, servant, when it says servant, it's very humble yeah? to be called a servant, shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high, just as many were astonished as you saw his visage was marred more than any man. So uh, th this looks like uh, Jesus Christ was so uh, taxed or so tired and his form more than the sons of men. Do, do you feel like you are tired sometimes? read this verse jesus christ was also a servant and he took all the load that we had so shall he sprinkle many nations but because he did that he's going to help many people including us kings shall shut their mouths at him for what had not been told them they shall see and what they had not heard they shall consider so it is a great opportunity to be like jesus and to uh, execute god's will here on earth so isaiah 53 verse 1 through 12 talking about the sin bearing messiah it says here verse 1 who hath believed our report and to whom has the arm of the lord been revealed for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground he has no form or comeliness and when we see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. Wait, 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 wait. I have to interrupt. Jesus Christ was not very handsome. Huh? <laughs> so don't worry if you're not handsome. It says here, uh, he has no form or comeliness. When we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. On the other hand, Satan was the most beautiful, I think. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful if we think we are handsome or beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I, I, can I continue? Because I really like to read this. Uh, he, he is despised and rejected. I mean, the, the reason I want to read this is because I sometimes feel despised and rejected by many people. I don't know why, but when I read this, I really feel that Jesus Christ, I can relate to Jesus Christ. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, my friend. Are you in sorrow? 
Read this verse. A man of sorrows, not only one sorrow or three sorrows, his life was sorrow. And he is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Have you ever cried and cried and cried? Jesus Christ felt all that you are suffering. He is a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. You want to continue? Yeah, I, I think it's also important for us to to recognize that even if he was a man of sorrows, he was not always sorrowful like he wasn't always like sad and crying there were times i think that i believe the sorrow sorrowful part is because he would see people sinning not knowing him and that makes him sorrowful like the 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 sinful things that people do but there were also times in the bible that you know children desire to be you know to be near to jesus they they were attracted to him and if you're a child you will not like you will not go near a man that is not you know, gentle or meek in, in countenance. So Jesus had had the countenance, you know, had, had a, he may not have like the, you know, handsome, all of that, but he was a carpenter's son after all. So we can imagine that his countenance would be like common, you know, very, yeah, he, he was um, used to labor. So yeah, his hand, he, he was not like the, gen, he was Callous. not, yeah, his hands was calloused. calloused yeah. <laughs> so, so he was not like the, the handsome type that we know now. I, I would like to read a quote from uh, Bible Commentary, page uh, 1147. Uh, this, it says here, so in, in reference to Isaiah 53, talking about his, uh, his no beauty was found in him, it says this, These words do not mean that Christ was unattractive in person. In the eyes of the Jews, Christ had no beauty that they should desire him. They looked for a Messiah who would come with outward display and worldly glory, one who would do great things for the Jewish na nation, exalting it above every other nation on the earth. But Christ came with his divinity hidden by the garb of humanity, unobtrusive, humble, and poor. They compared this man with the proud boast that uh, proud boast they had made and they could see no beauty in him. They did not discern the holiness and purity of his character. The grace and virtue revealed in his life did not appeal to them. See, the reason why is because they were expecting a conquering king. king yeah. And But when they saw this, this man who didn't have kingly authority, mm -hmm. I mean, they saw, this, they saw Jesus riding on a donkey. Very humble. And they saw palm leaves, you know, on the ground. I mean, who rides on a donkey if you're a king, king. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you want to ride on an elephant or you ride on a horse? And they borrowed the donkey, yeah? Yes. <laughs> and, and, and they also saw Jesus born in a manger, not in a hotel, not in, you know, a, the five-star hotel that they had during that time. He was born in a manger. He rode on a donkey. And, you know, who is this man? Like, And so they were like, how can this fit if he is our king? But why does he? They they don't treat him like royalty. Yeah, and the, and the practical side, I also just thought of this just now. Isn't it so easy for us to judge people by how they look? Like if if you dress nicely, if you have a professional look, compared to someone that you know just dresses so casually, you, we are prone to give more respect to those. You know, to those who are dressed professionally, we call them sir, we call them ma'am. But for those who are just dressed like, you know, that is like they're just at home, just refer to them as like, you know, like we don't even show them the, the respect that the human being could have. So I think that that tells a lot about um, recognizing inner beauty in a person as well. Because I, I, just, saw, I just thought of sharing that because in my Bible, it, there's a, I have a note here, it says, his inner beauty is more important. So it's like the things that he did, his sacrifice for his people. That's what the Bible emphasized here in Isaiah chapter 53, instead of like, you know, the outward appearance and the kingly yeah, look that he had. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I have never read, read that one, but it's really, I, I, you know, it helps us understand what this means. And we hid as it were, were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely, wow, this is one of my favorites, man. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We just hung on the cross. He took all our grief and our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. 
He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement, I think we, this, is, this is the second time we're reading it, but I really like it. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. I, uh, really, we are sheep. We don't know we are lost and we don't know how to go home. We have turned everyone to his own way. The, the, the Bible is so simple, but we have so many ideas. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I really feel so, you know, yeah, undeserving. Because this is Jesus Christ. I mean, he is God. And he suffered all our sins. Uh, it's like uh, you really get, I don't want to sin anymore if you understand what Jesus did. Yeah. You know what's interesting? It, it mentions there a sheep that has gone astray. The only way the sheep can go astray is if it's nowhere, it, it's, there is no shepherd guiding it. That means the sheep has left the shepherd. And if a sheep has left a, a shepherd, it's, it's called astray. You are led astray. And it's the same practical lesson with us. Many times we run astray from God when we are not near Him, when we don't experience Him daily in our, in our lives, and we do sin, we run away from the presence of God and, and there, therefore we experience being astray. And but it, but what's interesting is that even though we, we are astray, we are we've done our own thing, we, we have sinned, it says there that God put the iniquity, he takes the iniquity that is upon us and puts it on Jesus. So it's like there is a transferring of debt or transferring of sin happening like in the sanctuary right when the high priest right he, he takes the lamb and then he puts his hand upon the head of the lamb right before he right before uh the lamb's head is cut off you confess your sins that you did onto that lamb and it's like a transferring of all my sins all my iniquities upon jesus because i went astray I would just like to add to that, like reading through this as well, I was impressed to share this quotation from the book Desire of Ages. It's in the first chapter, and I think this is like, it, 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 enca <laughs> it encapsulates like the verses that we have just read. Um, it is found in the chapter, chapter one of Desire, Desire of Ages. Christ was treated as we deserve that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered a death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. With his stripes we are healed. So it's like, imagine the great exchange of what is meant to be ours, and he took that from us, and he gave us something that we do not deserve at all. Yeah, he is like uh, the he is the real the Lamb of God. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He didn't open when he was being interrogated. Yeah, he didn't speak. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare? his generation for he was cut off from the land of the living jesus christ died that means for the transgressions for why did he die for the transgressions of my people he was stricken and they made his grave with the wicked it is true but with the rich at his death oh this happened everything happened because he had done no violence jesus christ did not sin nor was any deceit in his mouth oh Isaiah says, Woe unto us, woe unto me, a man of uh, unclean lips dwelling with the people of unclean lips. When we see Jesus Christ, when we understand him, we feel very evil compared to him. But Jesus Christ did not tell any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the lord shall prosper in his hand you want to say can i just uh, clarify something because when i when i when i read this verse when i read this verse i was kind of wondering how what does this mean so maybe one of you can explain to me what does it mean it says yet it pleased the lord to bruise him does it mean that 
that God was like happy in doing it, pleased in doing it, or maybe there's a deeper meaning to that? I can understand it um, perhaps in a different context. It's not so much that God was wanting to, to, to bruise or to kill Jesus, but it was the fact that if his son didn't die, then we would be lost. So God was pleased that he was bruised and he even died because he, the, the end goal in mind was his people, us. And so he knew that the only, the only thing, the only way to save God's people was if Jesus would have to get bruised, suffer, and, and you know, get spit upon, and then die of sin, of separation from God, which, of course, is, is agony towards God the Father. And, but because of his death, it allowed for hu humanity to be saved. Because by his stripes, we are healed. So if Jesus did not have stripes, if he was not bruised, how can we be healed? How can we be healed of sin? Okay, these are really very deep. It means one thing, it means many things, but <laughs> everything is, uh, we will understand in heaven. But it gives us a clue. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. For that, 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 that includes us, yeah? For he shall bear their iniquities, therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. That means uh, he died voluntarily, and he was numbered with the transgressors. He was crucified with uh, two thieves, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for us, the transgressors. And there are more prophecies. Isaiah 7 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and he shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means? God with us. Yeah. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name, I feel like singing this, you know, have you heard the Messiah concert? And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, etc. All the nice things. So on Wednesday's lesson is in, Wednesday's lesson is entitled "The Unreachable Is Us," which is found in Isaiah fifty-three verses three to nine. And I'll uh, I'll let Cindy read this these verses. Isaiah fifty-three verses three to nine. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. I think we've read this earlier as well. Yeah. And what I just wanted to add something, or to like to, to emphasize something. The title itself of the of the Wednesday lesson is "The Unreachable Is Us." When we isn't it like you know, we describe the lesson describes us as unreachable? What does that tell you? Like for me personally, it tells me that we have we have fallen so low that it took like great effort to save us. And I remember also something that I've read earlier this week. It says that the whole creation of God had the character of God. Like he, they desired to give the sun desired, you know, the sun freely sheds its light on us the rain pours upon us the birds sing us melodious echoes and it says there something very interesting it says there is nothing save the selfish heart of man that means there is nothing except the selfish heart of man that lives unto itself that is so powerful that is in desire desire ages chapter yeah one, chapter one right and it's interesting because um when ellen white was writing that i uh, when i read that I thought, man, everything is giving glory to God. It gives. It gives for others. The sun gives light. The water sh uh, gives water. You know, uh, everything is about unselfish giving, selflessness. And then Ellen White, she says, however, <laughs> but man, on the other hand, is not giving. 
it 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 lives Live for its own it. self. It doesn't live naturally for others. And that's where Jesus comes in because Jesus wanted to take what the Father had given him to give to us. And what was that? His life, his 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 character of love. Jesus took to Jesus received to share, to give to to us. Uh, yeah, that's very nice. Not only that, it's worse. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Very heavy word. Yeah, very heavy and terrible word. And, you know, God took our place. Curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. We should have been hanging on that tree like forever, but Jesus Christ, you know, reached us unreachable. It's like you don't have load or you don't have signal or your phone is broken, but Jesus Christ got you anyway. For Second Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin. You know, sometimes something happens to some people, eh, they are bad even, it's okay. But you know, when, when something happens to good people, oh, kawawa naman, or, you know, we, we want to, we are, uh, but when something happens to good people, and it is your fault that something happened to good people, it's like you, hit somebody with your car and you were and it's very innocent device i don't know how to explain it but it's uh, it really bothers you and that happened to jesus christ because of all our sins him he knew no sin he became sin for us it's like he didn't he was not acquainted with you know he did he it was sin was foreign to him and then suddenly he had to to take the enormity the the weight of sin upon his shoulders so to me that's like the 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 efforts that god has employed to save or to reach us who are unreachable okay now that we understood all the great and marvelous things about jesus christ what he did the question is what can we do in response yeah the claim of redemption in uh, in amazing grace page 172 the stimulus volume 6 also page 479 it says in chapter 60 the claim of redemption since we were saved what i what is our opportunity you know if you if you if somebody did something to you you are very grateful you want to do something also you know it, you cannot be saved and not do anything tithes and offerings are for god an acknowledgement of his claim on us by creation you know, this is tight and offering. It looks like negative because it will reduce your money. But actually, it is a great opportunity, my friend. I have tried giving tithe. I have also tried stealing tithe. Stealing tithe is a great curse. I can tell many stories about that, my personal stories and our ministry stories. <laughs> but tithe is one of the greatest uh, opportunities and offering for God are an acknowledgement of his claim on us by creation and they are also an acknowledgement of his claim by redemption because god created us we give tithe and offering because god redeemed us man i think we have to give everything huh? nothing else you know when Zacchaeus, uh, no, uh, nicodemus understood john chapter 3 which just told him directly ellen g white says that he ran out of money helping the apostles so when we understand salvation and how it will benefit i think we will spend all our money like zacchaeus to also save others because all our power is derived from christ these offerings are to flow you know these days it's covid season we don't know when we are going to die <laughs> yeah sorry for that uh, statement but it's very scary we never know they are he they are to keep ever before us the claim of redemption the greatest of all claims and the one that involves every other the realization of the sacrifice made in our behalf is ever to be fresh in our minds and is ever to exert an influence on our thoughts and plans there is a part here that really struck me compute this uh, how much owest thou unto my lord how much uh, mark how much do you have to pay jesus christ for your salvation i mean how much do you owe god my friend cindy yeah we cannot compute it says here how much Owest thou unto my Lord? Compute this you cannot, since all that you have is his. Will you hold from him that which he claims? That is the tithe and offering. He calls for it. Will you selfishly grasp it as your own? 
Will you keep it back and apply it to some other purpose than the salvation of souls? Oh, my friend, don't try to do that. It is a curse from, ex from my experience. I can tell you. It is, uh, it is in this way that thousands of souls are lost. Because some people don't give tithe and offering. So thousands of souls are lost. I, if I, I wish I can just give uh, the offering for them so that uh, I can save those thousands of souls. You can be, how can we better show our appreciation of God's sacrifice, his great donation to our world than by sending forth gifts and offerings with thanks and giving from our lips because of the great love wherewith he has loved us and drawn himself. Wow, you know, I really like this topic because it's about money and it's about salvation of souls and uh, it's very exciting like the guy who from the prison yeah he said lord what wilt thou have me to do you know sitting in church is might be boring for you watching live stream might be boring for you and one president said uh, the wife said what uh, what what happened in church he said nothing why nothing because the preacher did not tell me to do anything you know understanding things is one thing but uh, doing something it's the most exciting thing. It's not boring. Lord, what will thou have me to do? He was told. And the answer is, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 6, 15. When you see souls in the kingdom of God saved through your gifts and your service, will you not rejoice that you had the privilege of doing this work? Wow. Of the apostles of Christ, it is reason they went forth, preached everywhere, and the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following Mark 16 20. So, um, in relation to like giving tithes and offerings, I think it's very, very easy for us to give without, without the heart. It's like we give, it's, it's possible to give without loving, you know, without truly loving the work or truly loving what you're doing. But when you put love first, it's impossible for you not to give. So it's like people sometimes we, we give, but are not, our heart is not really in it. But it says that God loves a cheerful giver and we will only be cheerful givers if we really um, incorporate love. If love is really there, if we really love the work of God, we really love to see it finish and you know, for, move forward. So I believe that's also an important aspect of giving, that we give and with love. Yes, and you know it's 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 crazy to, I mean it's wonderful to think that our God is a giver. Um, he gave for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. I mean, like wh what kind of a God would give up His only Son? I mean, you can think of the the story of Abraham when God said to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice Isaac. And Abraham, you know, he could have thought like, man, what is God doing? You know, why is he wanting me to sacrifice my only son? But it was a test of the heart. And, that, and tithes and offering, I believe it, it comes down to the heart. It's, it's not so much how much you give, but do you give with the heart? How much of your heart is, 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 is God's? That's why everything that we have, everything that we own, everything that we, 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 we accumulate, is not ours it's all from god however god just asks a tithe you know a 10 10 percent and how merciful is god is god really is i mean he he deserves everything but he only asks for 10 percent. but in reality that 10 percent is a test of your heart i want your heart and if you give me your heart i can use you to save thousands of souls yeah, uh, stewardship is one of my favorite uh, topic. That's why I really like. And the, actually, if you compute that to the end, it says in Second Corinthians six, "Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift." You cannot compute the benefits that God gave us. So it's just a great opportunity to give tithes and offerings. Okay. So in Thursday we see here that there is a uh, offering that we have to give because of our sins yeah in the in the temple because if we sin there is an offering sin offering 
that we give but if we summarize all of this as i read it uh this giving this uh, activity transforms us it has a, when we see uh this process of our sins being forgiven we it it points us to jesus christ and it transforms us do you want to say something yes so uh this reminds me of the sanctuary services whenever someone had sin they were to bring a lamb that was unblemished or that was you know pure and they had to confess their sins upon the lamb and then as a result the head of the lamb would be cut off and that blood would be gathered by the high priest and taken into the sanctuary sprinkled on the altar and also on the veil and that sinner who confessed his sins by faith was to believe that his sins was to be covered by the blood of the lamb of jesus and because of that blood he was to have faith that his sins is one day going to be cleansed or removed from the veil i mean if you think about it uh it it's actually called the day of atonement and it happened once every year in the old testament and once a year all the sins that have been accumulated by the children of israel uh, was to be removed from the sanctuary and then the sinner can have that that uh, that sense of i'm free my sins are cleansed and so the lesson here is that oh we have a, we have a object lesson object <laughs> lesson here <laughs> go ahead so is this a lamb or goat oh <laughs> lamb goat i don't know <laughs> Uh, furthermore, it says in Leviticus 6, 1 to 7, it's about the loss of the burnt offering, the grain offering, and the sin offering. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, if a person sins and commits a trespass against the Lord by lying, sometimes uh, uh, people don't want to talk about sins, but it's in the Bible. We have to identify and otherwise we don't know what to repent about. By lying. So lying is a sin to his neighbor. What was delivered to him for safekeeping or about a pledge or about robbery is also a sin or if he has extorted his extortion is also a sin or he has found what is lost and lies concerned uh, this, they didn't give the uh, lost atm or lost wallet and swears falsely is in any one of these things that any man may do in which he sins it is a sin and then it shall be because he has sinned and is guilty he shall restore what he has stolen so if you steal something we have to return and of the thing which he has extorted return and what was delivered to him that's why it's uh, transforming uh? we have to uh, return what we stole or what was delivered to him for safekeeping or the lost thing which he found or all that about uh, one time i stole something but i returned already <laughs> i stole the you know sometimes sometimes it's just funny but sometimes we steal the you know the number in jalebi yeah but the holy spirit uh, came to me and i returned in secretly to that the branch already so uh, praise the lord i don't feel guilty about it anymore but i feel like i have been forgiven for he shall restore its full value and add one fifth more to it my interest and give it to whomever it belongs on the day of his trespass offering and he shall bring his trespass offering to the lord a ram without blemish from the flock with your valuation as a trespass offering to the priest so the priest shall make atonement for him before the lord so sin separates us from god but because of this sacrifice jesus christ sacrifice we can become at one with god again and he shall be forgiven wow for any one of these things that he may have done in which he trespasses so my friend though our sins be as scarlet because of jesus christ sacrifice in the cross we can be forgiven we can be as white as snow and god will throw our sins in the bottom of the sea you, you know i just thought of something um you know the bible talks about lying and you know in the ten commandments you know god says ex explicitly thou shalt not lie right um and when you understand also about lying um sometimes it's also not telling the full truth 
sometimes it's just telling a half truth, but you're covering up, you know, the other truth that you don't want to share, which would be a lie. And so, you know, if, if you were asked, did you steal uh, or did you eat the chips in the bag? D did you eat all the chips in the bag? And then your answer is, no, I didn't eat all the chips from the bag. I just had a few chips. But in actuality, let's say you ate al almost all the chips in the bag. It's like you're covering up, you know, for yourself. It's like saying, uh, 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 have you ever had that experience, sir? Like when, you, when someone tells you like a half truth, and, and how do you deal with that type of person? No, no, I have told my own lies oh. and my own sins. I, I don't want to give a testimony for other people. I have my own sins. So Paul says, uh, sinners of whom I am the chief. But you know what, my friends? Uh, if God can forgive us, can refund us, can forgive us, they, there is assurance of salvation. Yeah? So assurance of forgiveness of sin. There is nothing to fear when we come to God only to God to confess our sins. Ellen White says that God abhors every species of dishonesty. A oh, very heavy uh, phrase. Every species of dishonesty. And you know, if you have ever cheated, if you have ever used uh, pirated software, if you are still using now, you have uh, copied the MP3s illegally or movies, or uh, cracked software or uh, photocopied book illegally all of these small things Jesus suffered for them we are not sometimes we are not serious about them but uh, God can forgive us from our sins there is no reason we will not repent because God can forgive us from our sins praise the Lord I just want to read this Psalm 32 1 and 2 not I don't know the Bible is not full of condemnation and definition of sin and making us feel guilty but it is a book of forgiveness it says in uh, Psalm 32 1 and 2 says blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit wow but god this is one of the other favorite verse romans 5 8 do you want to read it i get all, to enjoy all the reading okay, romans 5 verse 8 says but god demonstrates his love his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners christ died for us that really strikes me we were still sinners christ died for us we didn't know what to do we were doing foolishness and christ was suffering for us ah when we understand this, we will really hate sin. I think I would just like to add that to that as well, Sir Win. I read in the Sabbath school lesson that Christ's death magnifies the law. Is that <laughs> to, to expound on that? It's like the seeing how what what law sorry seeing what sin did to Jesus. It tells you of of like the, the seriousness, is that a word? Seriousness of the law. Because it says, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. And we see that death. Jesus died that death. So it's like it, it fulfilled the law. It magnified the law. It did not do away with the law, but it fulfilled and magnified the law. So I also, um, it also appealed to me how Jesus sacrificed himself voluntarily. It's like we talked about Abraham and Isaac earlier, diba. Right? And Abraham, when he, I can imagine, when he told Isaac that God told me to sacrifice you. And if, if Isaac was not willing, he could have easily escaped from the scene, right? His father was old. He was, he was still like strong, but he was still, he had said still the vigor and the strength. So he could have easily outrun his father. But when he, when, when Abraham told him that God told, told him to, to offer his son, he willingly sacrificed himself as well. So I see, I see the same humility and willingness in Isaac and in Jesus. So I think that's, that's just beautiful to ponder upon, being willing to give ourselves. So as we summarize our Sabbath school lesson, lesson 10, we see that 
in the book of Isaiah, there is an, it's an interesting outline that he outlines the life of Christ, the birth of Christ, the life of Christ, the struggles that Christ had, specifically the struggles that he faced during the cross, during the crucifixion, the spitting, the whipping, uh, the bloodshed, the agony, the pain, the suffering that he experienced, all the way to his, his death as well. But then not just his death, but also his resurrection, and then eternity through the ceaseless ages with, with mankind. And it just goes to show that the, the ultimate theme behind this is the great controversy of God versus Satan. And in the end, God wins. Satan is defeated. He's a defeated foe. And the way we can experience the, the victory of Christ is by looking at Jesus, looking at his life, looking how he dealt with temptation, looking how he dealt with sin, looking how, uh, how silent he was when he was being persecuted with questions. I mean, he didn't even speak a word. Uh, even though Jesus was not the most attractive person, you know, he still... Uh, was attractive on the inside. And I think that's what we need to, to have, you know, as, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we need that, that, that character of God. Because if you think about it, Satan wanted to be like God, not in character, but in power and position and authority. But us, we want to be like God, not in power, position, and authority, but in character. And the only way to understand the character of God is by looking at the life of Jesus, specifically his death, his life and death at the cross and his, of course, his resurrection. And that gives us hope that we can become obedient when we look at the one who was obedient and who sinned not. And we have, uh, uh, as Ellen White says in Desire of Ages, we have a, a what do you call it, the sinner the friend of a sinner, friend of, friend of sinners. Imagine you are a sinner, but you have no savior. Jesus was their savior. And, he, and because of that, he was also their friend. And now he could relate to the sinners. And so if we're struggling with that, you know, we can always come to Jesus. I want to uh, read a quote from uh, Inspiration. Uh, Ellen White, she says here, Christ our Savior, in whom dwelt absolute perfection, became sin for the fallen, fallen race. He did not know sin by the experience of sinning, but he bore the terrible weight of the guilt of the whole world. He became our propitiation that all who receive him may become sons of God. That's the hope that we have. We can become brothers and sisters or sons of God. And then it says, the cross was erected to save man. Christ lifted on the cross was the means devised in heaven for awakening in the repenting soul a sense of the sinfulness of sin. So in other words, the cross was to awake in our minds how bad sin is. And then she says, by the cross... Christ sought to draw all to himself. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. And then she says, He died as the only hope of saving those who, because of sin, were in the gall of bitterness. Through the agency of the Holy Spirit, a new principle of mental and spiritual power was to be brought to man, who, through association with divinity, was to become one with God. And hence the name Emmanuel, God with us. We can be one with God. I mean, if you think about how, how God pursued man even, you know, Jesus came to this world, you know, in the most holy place. And if you think in terms of the sanctuary, he said to Moses in ex Exodus 25, to, uh, 25 8, uh, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among, among my people, among them. He wanted to dwell with them. And, and, and being in the most holy place can only get so far. I mean, the only person that could go in the most holy place was the priest, the high priest. But Jesus went beyond that. He stepped down from his throne and 
took on the form of a human a human being and became a, our servant, our redeemer. And because of that, now he can dwell with his people. And in the end, in, in, the, in Revelation 21 and Revelation 22, it talks about, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. There will, there will be no separation between us and, and Jesus. We will be with Jesus forever. And that's the blessed hope that we have. And so what can we do? How can we uh, become more like Jesus? Well, there's a simple principle. By beholding, we become changed. Shall we bow down our heads for our closing prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this blessed time that we had. Thank you, dear Lord, for giving us excitement and zeal in dwelling upon the life of Jesus. We thank you, dear Lord, for impressing upon our heart this deep truth and for allowing us to grasp the preciousness of it. Father, I pray that um, we would continue to learn more of Jesus and not just of Jesus, but l truly know him personally as our Savior and as our friend. Thank you, dear Lord, because you desire to be with us. You desire to be our friend, and you are the friend who sticks closer than a brother. Even if everyone else would hate us or despise us, you will stay with us. We thank you so much, dear Lord, for everything that you have done to save us and to have us in heaven with you. Father, we are so undeserving. Nonetheless, we are grateful. Thank you so much, dear Lord, for your love. We ask and pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.